gift that you freely gave, that we receive by faith, uh, the gift that changes everything for us, that guarantees us an eternity of life with you. Oh Lord, that we would not take it for granted. Oh Lord, that you would soften our hearts to receive your message today. We thank you and we pray all these things in your name. up guys welcome back I'm so glad that you're here and you've tuned in um, <clears throat> I've entitled the word this week as you can see uh, the readiness of holiness so um, let me I think I put my phone uh, it's not on mute so let me do that right now okay so I hope you have your Bibles uh, we're gonna be looking at the book of Mark uh, chapter 13 24 through 37 so the book of Mark 13, 24 through 37. Um, right now we're in the season of Advent, um, which basically means that we're waiting. And uh, the reason why the waiting happens during uh, Christmas season is because uh, the Jews waited for their Messiah and the birth of Christ was their, the fulfillment of their waiting season of Advent. And similarly, we have an Advent and we think about it and we celebrate it and we study it, even though Jesus has already come and was born on Christmas Day. But for us, we as Christians now uh, have an Advent of waiting for Christ's second uh, coming, his return. So I hope that you keep that in mind. Um, it's a very important thing um, that Christmas uh, to us should be more than just, you know, presents and the music and the and the, the festivities, but that we would have that um, sobering um, meaning to this season. So I'll go ahead and read the scripture for us today, Mark 13, 24 through 37. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the, hev ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as, it, as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But, the day and, but that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on alert. Uh, I'm sorry, be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, to keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether it will be in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And all God's people said, Amen. I just want to quickly, while the verse is fresh on our minds, it says, don't find him, don't let him find you sleeping, the master. Um, and keep in mind in the Bible, sleeping, you know, can mean literally asleep um, in, in what he's saying. Like if a master goes away and the servant's sleeping, it's also, you know, more than just sleeping. It means you haven't been doing what you're supposed to do. And the Bible also uses the word sleeping to talk about death. Um, so don't, when Jesus comes back, don't find yourself spiritually dead because you've been doing other things. Um, but anyways, going to uh, the main point, uh, I wanted to tie this into holiness. I know that as Christians, we know what it means to be called to be holy as He is holy. It means we're set apart uh, in the way that we live, in the way that we think, you know, and in, and in trying to be holy, we don't engage in some of the same activities that worldly or non-believers do, um, you know, and we know that our calling is to um, to love others, to help the needy, um, to be thankful and to worship, not to let our souls and minds be corrupted um, with the poisons of this world. Uh, we have a different path. Um, 
you know, and all those things are super important and are so true. Um, but today we'll examine the aspect of holiness that I don't think is talked about as much, which is um, all of that, but also having this readiness of our hearts, um, this, this waiting type of holiness. So we'll, we'll explore that. Um, and, you know, something about us Christians that sets us apart is, is the very fact of waiting. The world is not waiting for anything in terms of the, you know, like they're not waiting for Jesus to come. They're maybe waiting for the end of their life or maybe they're not. Um, and, you know, they definitely do have a sense of waiting and readiness. Like, for example, when they might be waiting for the next hot item to be released, like it could be like the next colorway of a shoe or I've been waiting for the M1 line of the Apple products. I don't think I'm going to buy it, though, but I was kind of excited to see what it could offer. Um, some uh, are waiting for the new 2021 basketball season. Um, I think everyone's ready uh, for the pandemic to be over. Um, others are waiting and kind of ready to make financial moves or real estate moves because, you know, they're, you know, ready to make some money. Um, athletes are often ready and working out and training, even though they're not playing because they're ready to step up in case someone gets injured. There's also a readiness that we learn of in war. For example, in the Roman army, if you fall asleep at your post during your shift, uh, you would be killed. Like it was not a, oh, you might be killed. Like most of the time, if you, they've caught you sleeping on the job, you would be killed because it was that serious. Because if you were sleeping and some, the enemy snuck up behind you, and I don't know, killed a general or something or killed whoever it is you're guarding or took some important intel away, that was a big mistake. You know, your job would be to watch and to alarm, you know, be the alarm. But uh, if you failed to do that, then you're useless. And so they would kill you. Um, so it's a very important thing to do. Um, and in our, you know, U.S. military, there's a common saying that they use, which is hurry up and wait. Um, so, for example, if a certain meeting or an exercise is, is scheduled to start at 9 a.m., they'd have you get there at 4 or 5 a.m. <clears throat> I don't know from experience, but I have a lot of brothers that have gone to the military and they'll definitely be uh, familiar with the term hurry up and wait. And I think that's because... When you're in war, when you're in battle, you don't want to just show up like we still sleepy and like, oh, what are we doing? I'm here. No, no, no. You have to be ready all the time and you have to be in the mode of like, okay, I've already been here. I'm already prepared. I'm, I'm already on guard for what's coming next. Otherwise, you can get killed. So there's a sense of urgency and I think um, that's the type of language our passage uses. For example, in verse 33, it says, Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come, when Jesus' return will come. And the word guard comes from the Greek word blepo, um, which means that you take what you see, where you perceive, and you turn it into action. So if you're on guard and you're in the army, like if you see like, like uh, dust you know, forming and, and, and miles away, uh, you might think, okay, huh, I see and I perceive it and I understand that to possibly be the enemy starting to march forward. I'm going to go turn that into action and alert my people so that we can be ready so that we're not caught off guard. Um, the word alert um, comes from the Greek word agrupneo, which means literally to stay awake or to remain vigilant and careful, to be attentive and not have any unnecessary time off. Um, and those two words are related, but they're not the same. I think it's possible to be awake, but not on guard because you're awake, but you can just see things and you're like, huh, don't really care, don't really know. Um, and it's also possible to be on guard, like you see things and you're really ready to turn it into action and you do things. But if you're sleeping all the time, it doesn't matter how on guard you can be when you're awake because you're unconscious or unconscious or you're, um, you're asleep, basically. You're, you're so um, not alert that, you know, things go by you. And therefore, the word encourages us to be on guard and alert to know what is going on, to see the seasons and the signs that tell us what's happening next. 
Um, and, and our passage reminds us when the stars fall out of the sky, when the sun uh, doesn't shine anymore and the moon uh, changes its behavior, that Christ is near at the door. Verse 36 says, If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping, which means to be spiritually awake and on guard um, and to be able to put God's word into action. And I want to ask you, what are the things that can make you or me spiritually asleep? Um, and I guess another way of asking that is, what are the things that keep you from living a life as a Christ-loving, Christ-follower? Uh, what steals your time for prayer? What distracts your interest for the Bible and to knowing Scripture? What causes your heart to be compromised and to stumble? What influences have replaced the Holy Spirit as the one who leads you? And if you're able to answer some of those things and real things pop up, perhaps the first couple of things, I know your knee-jerk reaction might be to be like, ah, no. Or to, to be defensive and be like, no, I didn't just think that. But whatever just popped into your mind, those are real things. And those are the things that the Bible is really challenging you to set aside, to deal with. Because if those things put you to sleep, then what will happen when Christ comes and you're not ready? Or you're spiritually dead and you don't care? Um, it's a scary thought. And so this message today is a very kind of like wake up type of message. And uh, again, we know about love, we know about staying away from sin and keeping our bodies, our temples holy. Um, but the question is, how can this readiness and alertness that the Bible calls us and warns us to have, how can these commands bring a, a fresh dimension to our understanding of holiness? So when the Bible says, be holy, I think it also means be holy in the sense that you're also waiting for Christ's return and how that you know, really inspires you to be on guard and to be alert. Um, there's a guy named E.J. Gaines. He's like an executive for a gospel, um, uh, like a record label. And he's also a very godly man um, who had some, some cool thoughts um, on the return of Christ that I really want to share with you. Um, it's on Instagram. You can follow him, E.J. Gaines. Um, but this is what he said. I'm not sure that I really believe that Jesus could come back today. If I did, I would live a bit differently for the next several hours. The Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour of his return. If I'm honest, when I read that verse, I silently add on, but it probably won't be today. I do it subconsciously and without any kind of biblical basis whatsoever, and that is a problem because it undermines the way in which God wants me to spend my energy today. I think we hedge our bets and try to balance life in a way that we have decided is necessary. We can't really uh, live our lives as if Jesus is coming back at 5 p.m. today because we have deadlines on Friday. We have things to schedule at the end of the month. We need groceries for the week. It's a tough balance we find ourselves in. How do we meal prep for the whole week? while still believing, even hoping that Christ is coming back before Tuesday? How do we plan next year's vacation or mission trip, while still hoping in our hearts that Jesus returns before we see another summer? For one, we need God's grace to live in that tension, but also we must hold life loosely. Plan, but don't make plans into idols. Expect but don't cling to expectations. And above everything, hope, hope most for Christ's return while thanking Him for the great mystery of it. If we embrace it, the mystery of Christ's return compels us to spend all day giving generously, forgiving quickly, and cherishing what matters most. If He delays His coming, the day won't have been spent in vain, and we'll get to do it again tomorrow. I think that's what He's wanting from us each day to live in the mystery, to hold life loosely, and to spend every hour loving lavishly and living as Christ did. Man, what a wonderful like set of thoughts. I Man, I couldn't have put it better myself. And uh, I love how he says that living in that tension, because I think those are all things that we have thought. Like, like, okay, like, so what do you want me to do? Literally live like Jesus coming back tonight? Like, 
then I should just sell my whole house right now and just like be on my knees and pray like what well, you know we can't do that so I thought this was a really wise way of taking the knowledge that Christ gives the Bible gives us and to apply it into a way where it's a lifestyle and um, it's more uh, you know it's applicable it's not just a um, unwise way of living um, I'm going to end with this passage. It's 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 9. It kind of speaks to what uh, this guy is saying, but I think it's perfectly encapsulated in God's word. Here, here we go. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I think this, pa this passage right here just provides so much uh, detail as to how we should live our lives in that readiness of holiness. Um, and I want to focus on the word blameless. It means that we are to be above reproach. It has some legal background in it. It means if someone were to uh, thoroughly scrutinize your behavior, that you are not convictable. Like there's no offense to convict you of. Um, so basically, you're above the uh, your your actions are so perfect that you're above the law. Like you, the law can't get you. And while it is true that only the blood of Christ can really make us stand before God blameless and righteous, because on our own we don't have that. Um, innocence um, but the, the the other version of this word the other dimension of this word blameless is used in first timothy 3 10 as paul is explaining to timothy one of the requirements for a deacon is to be blameless so it's not just this perfection that it's talking about to literally not have any blame but a way of living um, that is above re reproach as much as possible um, so as it is Christ who saves us by justifying us and dying for all of our sins, it is also Christ whose impact on our lives allows us and empowers us and, and strengthens us to live in, in a blameless way. And that is something that we do each day as if it is our last through having fellowship with Christ. Another think key that unlocks this this calling to have a readiness of our holiness is to have fellowship with Christ, which is what it means is to participate in, in what God calls us to do. It means to act. It means to have an intimate community with Christ and other believers. And so constantly engaging in the life that God has called us to instead of doing other things, which makes us fall asleep, to be distracted, um, to be drunk, to be high, you know, on what it, it might not be drugs for you. It might be something else. I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't see you guys, so I don't know, but surely the Holy Spirit is convicting you in your heart, whatever that may be, that you would set it aside and not leave it empty, but to actively participate in, in this fellowship with Christ, which is to also do it with other believers. So that is my word for today for you guys. That is the word for us um, to have the readiness um, in our holiness. So let's go ahead and, and pray. We'll close. Heavenly Father, God, as we are waiting Christmas time to come around, God, may our hearts be filled with the eagerness for your return to not hold this life so tightly, to make idols out of people or things or expectations or our own plans or goals. Oh, Lord, but to um, to live as we should, but to know that you are returning um, to, to, to do the work that you've assigned us as your servants, God, um, to remain steadfast in them, whether it is to serve in church or in a Bible study, whatever capacity, Father, um, to continue to learn, continue to pray, and continue to be in fellowship with you. Um, and by your strength, God, um, that the testimony of who you are would be made true by the strengthening and the empowering that you do um, for us, in us. Lord, we thank you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful or had a wonderful Thanksgiving week. And as we uh, look forward to Christmas, I hope that you have the right things on your mind as we await uh, Christ's return. Um, I'll see, catch you guys next week. Bye-bye.